Greetings and salutations. I hope this video finds you doing well. I'm recording it on April the 23rd, 2020. This is the day when Ubuntu is going to be releasing 2004 officially. It is their next LTS release of their Linux operating system. One of the really cool things that is in Ubuntu these days is the ability to use the ZFS file system and boot from it. Plus, they're working on a project called ZSys, which automates ZFS snapshots. Now, if you have no idea what I'm talking about and you're brand new to this, hang around. You'll learn something. Um, there's a lot of folks out there who are very casual users of Ubuntu, using it at home, who may not understand what we're talking about when we talk about file systems in general. ZFS is a system that you can use to organize the data on your storage devices, your hard drives in your system. And it is a very, very advanced file system that has been living in the server and big data storage world for a very long time. It was developed by Sun Microsystems more than 20 years ago. And Sun was bought up by Oracle. There is an open ZFS version that has been running on Unix for quite some time, BSD Unix, called OpenZFS. What has kept it from development on Linux up until just a couple of years ago is licensing. Uh, there is some question about uh, whether it is not a violation of some sort of copyright claim that Oracle may have to run it on a Linux system. Canonical thinks that they've got that licked, and in the last couple of years they have gone ahead and developed it and uh, been working on it in the background. And so far, Oracle has not squawked about it, so we'll see how this goes rolling forward. That's where all the controversy about ZFS is coming from. You know, Linus Torvalds at one point said, don't use ZFS on Linux. And so anyway, I'm not going to get into all of that. We're going to look at the basic technical way that Ubuntu is using the ZFS system and why you might want to consider setting it up on your own system. Uh, like I said, if you're a newbie, you're going to learn something. If you're somebody that already knows a lot about ZFS, please be kind in the comments because I'm going to generalize and skip over a lot of stuff. We're just going to take a, a really broad view of the system and look at only a, a few of the features that it offers. We're not going to get very deep into it at all simply because most of the people who watch this channel would probably get lost. So be kind. This is for newbies. So this wonderful article appeared on the Pharonix webpage and it is trying out Ubuntu 2004 with ZFS plus ZSys automated apt snapshots. And that's exactly what I did yesterday is I reformatted my machine and reinstalled using ZFS as the main file system. I have a single hard drive in this machine. It is a Samsung Evo SSD, one terabyte, and I just let the installer set it up and uh, ZSys automatically started running in the background. Let's take a look at how that works. And oh, by the way, I know that in other parts of the world, some of you guys call this ZFS. And if you want to do that, that's fine. But I'm in America, and here I, we call that letter Z. If you want to call it Z, that's perfectly all right. It doesn't bother me one way or the other, whatever you want to call it. So first thing you need to do is install ZFS as your root file system on a computer. Now, I don't know what this does if you have more than one hard drive in the machine. I'm assuming that it only does it on SDA, but since ZFS is also a volume manager, it may look at all the drives in the system and try to put them all together as one big storage block. I have no idea if Canonical has it set up that way. If you are somebody who is adventurous and wants to try this for yourself and you have more than one drive in a machine, please let me know what it does. Put that in the comments below. I'd like to know how they're handling that. I'm kind of leaning toward the idea that it only does it on one drive. And if you want to bring another drive into the system as either part of the ZFS system or mount it somewhere else 
like an FS tab, that's something that you'd have to do. So essentially all you have to do here is when you get to the installer and you get to the part where it says installation type, choose erase disk, then choose advanced options, and then go down to use ZFS. They do warn you that this is still experimental. Above that, you can set up an LVM if you want to. I have never covered LVMs on this channel. I've never used LVMs. I don't recommend LVMs to people who don't understand exactly how the volume manager works. So I don't even know how to use it that well because guess what? I don't mess with it. Uh, I said that I would only talk about ZFS on Ubuntu once it became a menu option that you could just choose at installation. Guess what? That's where we're at and that's why we're talking about it. So anyway, you choose that and then the rest of the installation goes pretty much as you're used to. Now once you have it set up and you start installing your updates, you're going to notice that you get this extra line here where it says that it is um, going to uh, do a ZFS snapshot backup, something like that. The way the ZSYS works is, is that it automatically takes a snapshot of the system using the uh, XFS snapshot feature. And we'll talk how that works a little bit later on in the video. We'll get deeper into that. And it does it every time that you use apt to install or remove or update something. Therefore, if it goes wrong, you have a, a way to roll back. So to roll back, once you have done with, uh, you know, your, your setups, and let's say that you're... Um, you install video drivers and it doesn't work out or you put the wrong version in. We all know how big of a pain that can be on some systems if you're trying to be creative. That's why I usually just let the driver manager take care of it. But anyway, let's say that you do get adventurous and you do that and you mess it up. Well, you can reboot the system. You can get to the grub menu either by holding down shift or escape, whatever works on your computer. If you have EFI, I think you hold down escape and you hold down shift if you're not using a UEFI boot. You'll notice that we have a new entry here in the grub menu so not only can we roll back and boot on a different kernel we can also look at the history for Ubuntu we go to that and then it'll show us where our snapshot is there's our snapshot and then we can revert to that snapshot now uh, you can uh, just select that and then the machine will roll that back and it's uh, very simple that way now when they take snapshots, uh, the uh, system does separate your user data from system data. So it makes me wonder whether there's a way to maybe tell it to actually just roll back the operating system and leave my user data alone. I don't know. I haven't tried it yet. If you try it, put the uh, results down in the comments. I'd like to know what it does. I haven't had a, I'm actually doing this on my production machine. And I just haven't had a chance to do it. I just wanted to see if it worked, and I wanted to see how XFS, or rather ZFS, uh, would do on my system. So, that's pretty much the entire article. I will put a link to that. What we're going to do is we're going to take a little bit of a closer look, and I'm going to try and introduce you to some of the very basic things that are happening with ZFS. And, like I said, if you are a... ZFS expert, please be kind. Because I myself am not an expert, and this video is designed for newbies. So we've got a terminal up, and I'm going to go ahead and full screen this. Let's make it bigger. Let's make that a little bigger. Uh, by the way, that's Control, Shift, and Plus. If you want to make it smaller, Control and the minus key will do it. And then I'm going to make that full screen so we have a nice terminal there and then we've got our notes isn't this nice so the first thing that we need to talk about is how ZFS works with your disks what it does is it just sees them as big storage areas and it creates this thing called Z pools a Z pool can be thought of kind of, sort of, a little bit like a partition. But within a zpool, you could have partitions on disk drives. 
You could have entire devices. You could have arrays of drives strung together that work in some sort of RAID-like storage system, whether that be mirrored or parity. Uh, so a Z-Pool is just the largest, biggest top of the divisions of uh, the data system that is ZFS when you install it, if that makes sense. And then within that Z-Pool, we can put all kinds of different storage devices. In this case, we're going to create two Z pools. That's what Ubuntu does. And then they're going to be on different partitions on a hard drive. That's how they have decided to do this when they are working with a single drive in the machine. We're going to take a, a closer look at how that works a little bit later on. So just think of a Z pool as being a big pool of data doesn't really matter what devices are there or whether they're in parity or mirrored or striped or bridged or what it makes no difference you can set all that up if you want to so we'll take a look at the Z pools here and we just do Z pool list and you will see that Ubuntu has automatically set up two Z pools. One of them is called B pool, that's for boot, and R pool, which is for root. You can call those things anything you want to. You can name them Sam, George, Charlie. It doesn't make any difference. And so we see some very vital statistics going on here. Uh, like over here uh, for the R pool, where most of our data is, it's where the user data is. And, a lot of other things. Uh, this is how we can figure out our size. We've got 716 gigabytes available in that pool and it's uh, allocated is about 204 gigabytes. Uh, the total size is 920 gigabytes. And then if we work our way over here, um, it's not fragmented at all at this point. Uh, not sure exactly what cap is. I know that dedupe is a feature that I have read repeatedly should not be used. <laughs> so this said use compression. That's something I got to research myself. I got to learn more about. And then finally, it says that it's online. So that's our Z pools. Now, within a Z pool, we can create data sets or file systems. The terms are interchangeable. And so it's a file system within a file system. Think of those as. A combination between a disk partition and a mount point because usually you will create a data set and then you will want to mount it somewhere within the file system now that will make a whole hell of a lot more sense if I just show it to you so now we're going to run ZFS and then we're just going to give it list uh, to do and that's going to show us all of our pools and all of the file systems or data sets created within so let's start out with uh, bpool. So we have bpool there and you'll notice it's just like going down the tree of a directory here. We've got bpool and then within that we have root and then we have the Ubuntu system right there and I would assume that that would be well that's mounted to uh, you can see where the mount point is over here so that is mounted as the root system. Our pool is root and then within there now these are subdivisions within the file system itself this has nothing to do with where it's mounted these can actually be different virtual devices within the system so we could break out any directory anywhere in the system and say for some reason that we want to put it on super fast SSD storage for a database or something that can be done right here and this is all within the file system itself this is not happening at kernel level it is happening at file system level. Now, Ubuntu certainly has created a whole bunch of these lovely data sets. I mean, they have taken the var directory, for instance, and broken it out into we've got var games, we've got var lib, we've got account service, network manager, opt, var lib opt. It's dpkg. It's all broken out. Now, I don't know exactly why they've done that. It makes it a little bit confusing, especially for those of us who are starting out and may want to poke around and play with this. Uh, the main thing to understand is when you get down here, look, here's where your user data is in our pool. 
And uh, for instance, here's Joe. And then our mount point over here for that, that's my home directory, is home slash Joe. So that's where that appears. So it is keeping different data sets for all of this stuff for whatever reason. Because, I mean, you could make it real simple. I mean, you could have... You could have three Z pools if you wanted to, and had one for for root and home, and uh, I don't know. Now, when you're thinking in terms of partitions, you'll notice here that all of this stuff is living in the one R pool. Now we looked at our pools earlier, and you can see that our our pool is definitely the largest. It's 920 gigabytes out of the terabyte that's available on the disk. And unlike setting up different partitions for things as we would do with ext4 or xfs or something like that, in this case, uh, we don't have to worry about allocating enough space because sometimes you can run into a situation where, let's say that you wanted a different root directory for all of your system stuff to live, and you gave the system 15 gigabytes at some point, and then you realize that's not quite enough. You installed some games, and it started to grow, and now you're in trouble because the only way to really fix that would be to reformat the system and start over and make more space or try and edit it with something like Gparted and then what happens when you do that? Well, you might lose your data and it gets really weird. Well, these data sets, if you think of them kind of like partitions in a standard disk setup, they're pulling from exactly the same pool. So if the root data set gets bigger than what we thought it would be, no big deal. We have plenty of extra space because we're, we're all drawing from the same place. So that's kind of nice. It makes it really, um, you know, it's worry-free because one of the biggest things about setting up these strange partitioning schemes uh, with Linux systems is trying to figure out how much space to allocate things, especially if you're going crazy and breaking out uh, boot and var and user and all the different ones like that. So I hope you understand that. Now this is totally flexible. We can add to this, we can take away, we can do all kinds of stuff. I'm not going to mess with it because I don't know what I'm doing yet and I'm trying to let Canonical do their thing. The whole point behind this, by the way, is for you not to mess with it. This is so that they can have a very slick and easy way to roll back the system. And we're going to get into that next, which is... Um, snapshots. Now snapshots are basically a way to create a new data set within what we're looking at here that is read only. And in that data set uh, it will freeze time. So as the system rolls forward if it takes away or adds to that that original data set never changes and so therefore we can roll back to it and when you think of snapshots and backups in the sense of like using time shift or rsync to move a copy over somewhere else on the same drive or somewhere else that takes up space because you're making copies of things we're not doing that we're just telling the file system itself hey remember where you are right now so if I delete a file called uh, test.txt in my documents directory that was there when I took the snapshot, it really doesn't go away. It stays on the drive. The file system remembers where that data is stored. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if we roll back to the snapshot, it'll be there, even though I deleted it. Now, if I delete the snapshot at some point, then it'll set that free. It'll let it go. But it's not the same as making a copy of everything, and it's instantaneous. So what I was researching was uh, doing backups with uh, ZFS. The best way to do it is take a snapshot, right? Your snapshot freezes. So let's say that you have so much data that it's going to take two hours to do a backup. No big deal. We're not going to back up the live running system. We'll take a snapshot first. Then we will back up that snapshot to external media somewhere else that's not in the same system and we have that snapshot in time and then we can restore it later by mounting that back up to the system and saying okay make it look like this and ZFS will do that I'm telling you this stuff is crazy powerful it does some really goofy stuff so Canonical has it set up with uh, this uh, ZFS uh, 
or this uh, called ZSYS utility, that what it does is it takes a snapshot every time I change something with apt. So I installed this system yesterday. So what happens if we look at those snapshots? Well, let's go ahead and clear this. And just to avoid typing errors, I'm going to go ahead and just copy that in. Look at all of the snapshots that it's taken. This is every time that I have run the apt utility to install or remove or update software. It just goes on and on and on. See this list? These are all of the snapshots. So there's a ton in there right now. Now you'll notice that we're getting a snapshot for each one of these broken out file systems. So what I have heard is, is that you can specify uh, when you're restoring that you can say, okay, restore the system, but leave my user data as it is now. So you may want to roll the system back to a date two days ago, but you've created some files in your home directory that you don't want to see go away. I don't know how to do that. I have not actually restored a snapshot, so I don't know whether that gives you that option. Once again, if you do it, let me know. Tell me in the comments how that works, and then people can scan down and read the comments, and they can learn for themselves. You see what I'm saying? Pretty cool. Um, now, this makes me wonder whether there is not going to be some sort of auto-trim option uh, running with ZSYS. At some point, it's going to have to uh, remove some of these older snapshots. So. I couldn't really find a whole great deal of information telling me exactly how that works. I have heard that there is an auto trim function. So I don't know whether it keeps them for a month or two months or a year. I have no idea what this thing does. But I'm sure it does roll them back. Now, the snapshot thing and the way this set up, it it's all seems nice so far. But really, I have a very simple system. Why can't I just go ahead and use ext4 and install TimeShift? What would be another reason for me to want to have ZFS? And that would be the scrub and uh, the uh, checksums. ZFS is designed to make sure that the data that is stored in it is uh, as uh, integral as possible. It really looks at data integrity. I like that word, don't you? And what it does is tries to maintain that by every time that it writes something new, it creates a checksum. So it knows how big that file should be and where the bits should be and all that other kind of stuff. Now this does take a little performance hit on the system. It writes a little bit slower because it's keeping up with all this information. But unlike systems like ext4 and xfs, it can go back and look and make sure that the file is what it should be. So if something happens with the disk that you put it on and you get bit rot, for instance, it'll know that. It can go back and figure that out. And that's really not that big of a deal. Let's say that you have a picture or a song that has one bit flipped. Well, there's error correction in there. You wouldn't see it. It wouldn't make that big of a difference. But if you're dealing with database files with a whole lot of information, one bit being flipped is a big deal. One bit not being there, that's a problem. So that's what ZFS is made to take care of, to make sure that it has that sort of integrity. Now, there's no FSCK like we have with ext4 on ZFS or uh, XFS. It has a, a system check when it boots up as well. But the uh, way they take care of that is they do have a, a thing called a scrub where it will go through everything written on the file system and just make sure that it matches up with integrity. And it's going to try and fix errors. It's constantly doing this, by the way. It's constantly, as it writes and reads, it's double-checking the checksum and going, is that what that's supposed to be? And it will tell you immediately, some way or another, if there is some sort of an error. I would assume that... Uh, I have no idea how Ubuntu is dealing with that, but that's what I have read. It's that it's you know it can jump up and go, hey, there's a problem here. Uh, so Ubuntu has set this up to. Uh, let me go ahead and clear that and run that one more time so it's at the top of the screen. Um, they have set up a cron job, as you can see here, that the second Sunday of every month it's going to do a full scrub of the system. And uh, that is, 
I, I don't know how long that's going to take. It will depend on how much data you have on the system. And uh, I'm assuming that if you have a regular old laptop, maybe you have, I don't know, I've got 250 gigs on this machine, so it might take it, I don't know, uh, maybe an hour to do that if it's going through every file, which I'm told is it that it will do. But I'm making assumptions. If you know, put it in the comments below. I certainly do would appreciate it. Uh, somebody had asked me yesterday, Jeremy O'Connell, we were talking about this, Jeremy O'Connell at Cyber Web Solutions, who's a big ZFS fan for servers. Uh, he is Mr. Server, and he is the guy who does the engineering for the Easy Linux website. You can check him out by going to easylinux.com, scrolling down to the bottom, and simply clicking on the link to Cyber Web Solutions. Anyway, he was asking about how often they do a scrub, and seems that Canonical does this once a month on every second Sunday, which is uh, considered to be okay. Some people say to do it once a week, but uh, ZFS is so good at data integrity while the system is running that I, probably once a month is enough. Making assumptions once again, though. That's for sure. So if you're curious about how your ZFS install is doing on Ubuntu, why, well, you can just pop open a a, a terminal and then you can do zpool status and it will tell you everything you needed to know about what's going on with the setup here and uh, we can see that bpool is online we have uh, no scan requested at this point but we have no known data errors either see it actually goes and looks with ext4, yes, we do have a journal, and that journal keeps track of what is written where at a very high level. It just keeps up with file names, and uh, the data pool that ext4 uses uh, is different. And once it's written, as far as ext4 is concerned, it's there, and it should be there every time that I go look at it. It doesn't take into account something happening with the block storage device that it's on no idea so that's how you would look at that now before we we get out of here let us just kind of look and see what this looks like with uh, some of the regular tools and it seems my neighbor's dog is upset so you can probably hear him barking in the background there ain't nothing I can do about that y'all gonna have to deal with it so let's look what it looks like when you look at discs Well, Disks knows that this is uh, a, a free BSD formatted disk, which would be a ZFS because uh, FreeBSD is uh, an operating system that's Unix, by the way, that's been using uh, ZFS for their main boot for a long time. They've been doing this forever. We're just we're just now getting to this in Linux. They've been doing it for quite some time, so they have quite the uh, the the interesting and um, complicated the uh, partitioning scheme going on here don't they and it looks like that they've elected to do MBR with um, an extended partition it's what it looks like to me at least I don't know why they didn't go for GPT but I don't know uh, this machine that I'm doing this on is rather old it does not have EFI boot although they did create what appears to be an EFI boot partition on here. Uh, so maybe that's why it, it set it up like that. Don't know. You guys can do this on a UEFI enabled machine and see what you get. So that's what disks looks like. What about some utilities in here? And let's see. Go ahead and full screen that. Thank you very much. Uh, let's look at DF and see what the output looks like. And I'm going to make that humanly readable. This is disk free, by the way. And we get a lot of output, don't we? <laughs> it looks like that it actually shows you each different uh, data set in each Z pool. And of course, it will also show you uh, your snaps down here at the bottom. So that's what you get in DF. It doesn't necessarily anywhere tell me. Well, I guess I could figure that out. Probably better to use the ZFS tool for that, but I'm just curious. You get a lot of gobbledygook on the screen. Let's put it that way. 
Let's look at LS block and see what it tells us. LS block, well, that's a little bit more simplified. And it shows that we have a swap partition that is on SDA3. Five, so that would be the first extended partition. So they're definitely using MBR. SDA1 is boot EFI, and they set that, set that up on a machine that doesn't use UEFI. Then we have the logical partition that comes in that we can put the extended partitions in. So we have swap, and then we have, I guess that would be B pool, the first one, two gigabytes. And then we have R pool, which is 927, right? No. We can we can look at that up. We can we can check that. We can double check that there. So yeah, let's see. B pool says that it's on SDA six, and uh, the R pool is on SDA seven. So that's what we're looking at. Right. What else we got here? Uh, let's take a quick look at the free utility. I'll talk a bit about memory. So we're going to do this in humanly readable numbers as well. Um, let's clear the screen and do that again. Okay. Now, one of the things that you're going to hear is that ZFS takes up more memory. I don't know whether that's exactly true. I haven't played around with it, but I've also heard that some people are running systems with ZFS that have one or two gigabytes of memory. And of course, they're probably not running a desktop and it, it works fine for them. You will notice here that we seem to have like a lot more available, uh, or rather uh, not quite as much in the buffer cache and a lot more available than we would ordinarily see on an EXT4 system. And that's because one of the things that ZFS does, it does a better job of actually using the system memory for caching, whereas what ext4 and i think xfs do as well is they just everything they read they just throw in there and then the oldest gets thrown out as more memory needs and newest this kind of keeps track of it and knows that some of it needs to stay there and some of it doesn't need to stay there at all don't ask me how all that works so we're using 4.3 gigabytes of space uh, so far with memory and we've got a web browser open we have the text editor we have a terminal running we have the application that's recording the video and I've got a picture for my closing slide and that's how much it's taken up uh, we have a swap space it's not being used at all uh, but in the buffer cache you see we only have 879 uh, megabytes well they're not that's not megabytes those are maybe bytes that's what the I means a little bit different there. Megabytes and mibibytes and gigabytes and gibibytes. That's a whole different video. So yeah, that's the memory I'm currently using on this machine right now. Performance-wise, I can't really tell that much of a difference, to tell you the truth. I thought at first that it may have been running just a little bit slower, but since then, I can't really see that much of a difference. Uh, so we'll see how this works out. A modern laptop with eight or more gigabytes of memory, I don't think this would present any kind of an issue whatsoever. None. Of course, uh, you could try that yourself. You could, it, If you have two laptops that are exactly the same, you could install one with Ubuntu using EXT4 over here, and then you could install another with Ubuntu using ZFS. See for yourself. I'm sure somebody will do that and make a video out of it, and it'll be very cool. So there you go, gang. That is a look around, and I hope you got something out of this. Let me go ahead and just jump down here, because we're going to finish this video up. I think that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about. Yeah, nifty new things coming down the pike from Canonical in 2004. This has actually been around for a while, but I figured now would be a good time to go ahead and look at it. And I'm using this as my daily driver. This replaces TimeShift, which is the program that I usually use. Uh, to take snapshots of the system that allows me to roll things back if I screw something up. haven't done this on any of my other machines yet, and I don't know whether I will, because it is technically still considered to be experimental. But uh, one of the things that you can take away from this is that we have spent quite a bit of time here talking about this. To the end user who doesn't care about any of this, 
they won't even know it's there. It's automatic. And you could put your grandma on Ubuntu with the Mate desktop on it, let's say, get her all set up, and you're running uh, ZFS. She calls you up one day and she says, oh, the machine, it doesn't work right. I installed a piece of software and it, it messed something up. How do I fix it? And you just say, okay, reboot the system, hold down the shift or the escape key, whichever one works on that version of Grub. And then you say, all right, see where it says history? Okay, choose yesterday, Grandma. Okay, press enter. Boom. You're done. And oh, one thing I forgot to mention was is that you can manually restore snapshots. You can create manually snapshots and restore them as well. I probably did mention that, but you still can do it if you want to, even though ZSys is running. So that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for watching. Your feedback is always welcome. Check us out on the internet at easylinux.com. Also, check out Easy Talk, which is our very own forum we have there. It is free, secure, and fun because we control it. That's not something that's being run by some mega corporation that we're just taking advantage of. No, that's on our own server, and we have some very nice moderators in there that kind of keep things nice. And uh, you can get some interesting information about Linux Mint and Ubuntu and other things as well. Also, if you are a Facebook user, please give us a like. I would appreciate that. And of course, if you like the video, give it a thumbs up and a subscription is always very welcome. As a matter of fact, the button to do that is on the screen right now. We'll do it again soon. Thanks for watching.